Hello there, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Neal from the Widget Agency, and uh, I am going to uh, bring in our guests for today's Classic Conversations. With me, we have Sheila from MBZ Pipe, or Parts, and we have uh, Wynn and Michael. How's it going, everybody? Very well, Great. thank you. Great, glad Hi to be there. here. So um, today we are going to have a conversation about restoring classic Mercedes. Um, everything about acquiring parts, some specific model rebuilds, all kinds of, of fun around restoring these, these classic Mercedes. So um, Sheila, why don't we kick it off to you and, and you know start us off with what brings us all together here. Oh, sure, yeah. So I'm the CEO and founder of MBZ Parts. Um, I've been running this business for about nine years now. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to know some of our customers a little better. Uh, Michael and I had been um, emailing back and forth this year. Um, looking forward to hearing some stories from Michael and Wynn about yeah how they got into these cars, their joys, successes, and tragedies. <laughs> Uh, so, so Michael and Wynn, um, why don't you guys talk a little bit about what started your love of, uh, of classic Mercedes? For me, it was two things. In 1973, when I was 15 and could already drive, my grandfather pulled up one day in a, a 1973 450 SE. Uh, British racing green, tan leather. It was the most beautiful car I ever saw. He came in the house, threw me the keys and said, let's go. And that was it. And it, in my opinion, there's no better cars. They ride the best, they drive the best, they look the best, they're rolling artwork. And I was spoiled from 1973. The uh, I guess the other part of it is that I grew up around other other cars, other Mercedes. Um, I grew up underprivileged in, in the North Shore of Chicago. And um, one particular, my best friend's dad was a collector and had a, a lot of cool cars that we used to sneak out. And um, it was kind of got to be addicting. <laughs> So Sheila, what brought you into your love of classic Mercedes? Oh, that is a good question. I actually, I grew up, uh, I grew up as a diesel gal. My first car was a diesel Datsun pickup. Um, I didn't have a lot of Mercedes exposure. I'm like getting a little bit jealous of hearing Michael's uh, teenage Mercedes access and exposure. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I, I actually went from, uh, I, I got into diesel Volkswagens for a while. And the deeper I was diving into the diesel world, you know, this is early 2000s um, when biodiesel was still a thing. Um, and I ended up getting a really great deal on a 79 300 SD 116 chassis. Um, and after drive after years of Volkswagens, it was just yeah, you know the luxury, the comfort. I my actually so my grandma always drove Cadillacs, so I had that like desire for that big boat luxury car. Um, but going yeah, going from Volkswagen into Mercedes, I just you know felt like a queen. <laughs> Um, it was, it was beautiful. And I, and then I started diving into working on them from, uh, I started working for this, uh, Cuban guy who owned a shop in Portland. He had been, uh, factory trained in Germany. Um, so I, I was able to learn a lot of things from, from him and it just kind of sparked the interest just, you know, uh, spiraled out from there. Well, that's fantastic. So. Um, while we're having this conversation, everyone that's joining us on Facebook Live here, 
we want this to be an open conversation. So as we're getting into the rebuilds and as we're getting the specific models, if any of you want to pop in a question or, or make a comment or anything like that that you want me to bring to the panel here, go ahead and type it in the comments section on Facebook Live there. Uh, I'll be able to see it over here and I'll read it out to everybody. Um, so uh, while we let the, the car people get into it here and, and – uh, I guess there, there's been talk of a drag racing story of some kind. What, what's that all about? I'm excited to well, hear this one. Um, I mentioned that my best friend's dad was a collector. And we, we were shameless, <clears throat> probably fearsome fools in our teens, just snuck the cars out. And uh, the best one was was the was the gold six hundred, and um, we didn't have to. That was it. There it is. And the, and that was actually the second six hundred I was in because my dad had clients in Hamburg, and they picked me up at the airport in a black six hundred, so extra spoiled. But that was it. We used to sneak those cars out. You're getting a lot of love on that 600 right there. I don't know if that right now in the comments here. The um, only problem so, only problem is you can't really afford to own them now. I can't. Just as a as a newbie um, to the Mercedes, what what how rare is a, a model like this, a, a vehicle like this in that condition, Sheila? So the 600 was like the the ultimate flagship series. Uh, like the diplomat car or dictator car, depending on what angle you want to put on it. Um, so, you know, they are the top of the line. I don't even, I don't know the production numbers. They're very small, especially in comparison. So the 116, which we're going to be diving into um, more when we hear about their restoration projects, is a relatively low production car. I would say that the 600 is, you know, Left, definitely less than 5% of the numbers of even the 116, which was a uh, low production vehicle. I don't, I don't know anybody that owns one. Uh, <laughs> they're definitely still out there, but not very many. Not very many in, in production anymore. Um, how, well, no, the 600s are... Go ahead. Yeah, these are from the 60s, so... <clears throat> Stop making them in 71. 71 yeah so how did how did drag racing play into this well it was just a, a a minor teenage folly in the 600 just that you know two two spoiled kids had the cojones to go and drag race that car what did you race against uh, just on you know by the shopping centers other people just I, drag racing is probably an embellishment, but just yeah. driving that car in public, yeah. sneaking it around. There you go. So, Had, I, um, what what was the feeling like? You know, a teenager getting your hands on a vehicle of that caliber. Like I know when I started driving, I had a I think it was a seventy two Ford Granada in Kermit the Frog green. So and, and that was green inside and outside you can kind of imagine that monstrosity um you get your hands on a vehicle like this it probably has to change your perspective on the artistry of an automobile moving forward it sets a bar right well first of all there's an involuntary grin that i've not wiped off my face since i was 16. <laughs> Okay, I mean, that's the reality of it. And it's the same driving the 116s. They are, you know, you're driving a piece of artwork and a, and a piece of engineering that is not the same as driving other cars. That's maybe all I can tell you. The power, the control. Um, my 116 is a monster. They're solid. And yeah, they're, they're solid and they're just so pretty. So it, it's it, it's the involuntary grin. I would say that that is the best way I can describe what it's like. No, 
I, I've never heard it described that way, but I actually had the exact same experience at 23, you know, being behind the wheel of a 116. It, yeah, it completely changed everything. And, you know, I don't think people really understand when you like that capturing, driving down the road, driving down the highway with the motor roaring and just looking at that silver star as like a framing for the rest of the world, um, you know, thinking about it that way, it's just like being in one of these cars changes your perspective. Um, and it's something that you can't return from. There's no going back. Now, my children who have driven my cars say that, that after having, I, I let, when, when one of my daughters was uh, living in Texas, I let her use one for six, eight months. And she has said getting in other cars is just, it's just a completely different thing. And, and my son will say the same. Absolutely. So let's pivot the conversation over to some of the restorations. Um, what, what, what is one of the first restorations you've begun working on here that we can talk about? The first one was the 380 SL, the, the two-door, the, the R107. We bought that car in Chicago knowing it had a few issues and we rebuilt a lot of it there. And then we uh, shipped it to California, which is why we bought it. We lived in California, but we bought it in Chicago. That's gonna be and this one right here, right? Yes. This is our guy. It's yes. Beautiful. And that car is now Euro spec. It was not. Um, we had those Euro bumpers fabricated in Burlingame near the San Francisco airport and okay. put the Euro lights in. So that is not what that car looked like when it was brought to the United States. Initially, it had the big American bumpers on it. It had, when I bought it, it had chrome on the wheel wells that I didn't like. It had a pinstripe that I didn't like. So we've tried to bring it along to what we like now. All right. And I got to tell you, the Facebook family has spoken. As soon as we show <laughs> the car, we're getting some love. Um, we've got Belinda. <laughs> and I, I, I'm sorry, Belinda, I am going to murder this last name. So I'm not even going to attempt it. But uh, Belinda says um, the W116, the first official S class. And she says she loves hers too. And, you know, it's the looks of respect that she gets driving <laughs> the car. That yeah, it is really it's... great for her. So, Belinda, I'm sorry that I'm too much of a Midwesterner for that last name, but I think we all share your sentiments on that vehicle. So, so Sheila, what, what's been your experience with this this model and this chassis? With the 107, I mean, I, ha I first I just have to say that like the Euro specs on this black 380 SL with the bunt wheels, it looks so good. Um, 107 is one of those cars where it's hard, it's hard to love the, the U S bumpers, especially when you see one like that, it almost looks like a muscle car, um, like an American muscle car. And it, that element of it really makes it a lot more timeless to me. I think you all did a really great job. I'm trying to like imagine it the way you're describing it with a pinstripe because I've, you know, I've seen those. Um, and this just looks really different. And um, it's that it adds that timelessness that I think those big US spec bumpers um, kind of took away in a, in a sense. You know, I think you were talking earlier about the 116 US bumpers, which are even larger, but. Um, yeah, it looks and great. Just, just as, yeah. When, well, when we tried to make that, that restoration? car. Pardon me? Um, we, I'm wondering when you did all that work to it. When did we? We did that, and most of the work on that car was 2012, 2013. Okay. And we recently had it. Uh, stripped down, down to the metal and repainted. That's a brand new paint job. 
Nice. It looks great. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, all that work that you had done was a great investment. I've really seen the 107 change dramatically, and I, I see a lot of people buying them right now um, yes. because they see the value starting to climb, um, and they're still somewhat affordable, but becoming less so to find, you know, good restoration candidates. Um, so I, I think this was a, a good investment in time and money to make this happen, you know, mostly eight, nine years ago, especially um, because I, I've really seen it during that time, I've seen the 107 shift. It used to be not that hard to find, to find, you know, low mileage vehicles that were in definite need of restoration, but with good bones for under five or even, I, I even saw some, you know, under 3000, um, you know, I'm talking back in 2000. Not anymore. Not anymore. No. And I, right. I'm seeing that go for much, much higher. So I think holding on to them, restoring them right now really makes a lot of sense. And um, even, you know, the, the 380 SL 10 years ago, nobody cared about, um, you know, people were doing the 450s, but, um, I think the 380s, they have some, I mean, the climate control is superior. I, do you like the climate control in your 380 SL? I'll, better I'll than put it you? this way. Most of the time it's excellent. <laughs> you know, I've had my my challenges with it but you know some climate control doesn't ever work and to buy a car like that is not good and and this was a consideration with this car this car you mentioned good bones everything worked on this car so it, it needed things but uh it was functional what what was the biggest challenge in tackling this project i think you said you had a good mechanic um well there was a right. little there was a um yeah the uh one of the wheel wells had been hit and i didn't know it and i replaced it so I, that was a surprise and that's life that was probably the you know that that took some work was going to be a three-month project it turned into 18 months we have a a, a a mechanic in tijuana who's fabulous but he takes his time so that's just part of the game here you have to be patient with these cars because you don't know it's like rehabbing a house when you get into it you're not really sure what you're going to find yeah when I want to hear from you about what it was like for you to get launched into this project, like, had you had much experience with classic Mercedes before? No, you... no. When I when I met Michael, um, Mercedes were there was talk about Mercedes, but they were not actually on the scene, and I had no idea that now at this point in my life, I could be conversant in things like window regulators and um, what are the, 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 the key- um, the Ignition tumbler the ignition that freezes tumblers, up. Yeah. Euro bumpers, Euro lights, um, you know, 116, 107. And um, when I first started driving these cars, it does. It's like what you said with your children, your entire perspective on, on driving changes because everything else, I would say modern now, feels like a plastic toy. These cars are solid. You feel like you're, you're I don't know, you, you are, this is how those cars are supposed to be. Correct. You know, and I would say, I want to mention one thing about one of your 116s, uh, even though at the time, what was that, the 1980, the blue one? Um, it reacts so well. Uh, we avoid, averted an accident so beautifully. I mean, it, it, the car saved our life. And it was at that time, you know, what is that, 30 years old? And it just was just, just so tight and right on. And we just looked at each other and went, thank God for this car. A Marin County fire truck ran, came out of nowhere 
And that car literally pivoted us out of the way. I, it, it happened very quickly, but it was remarkable. As old as the car was, how agile it is. That but, sounds but I, like, I, oh, sorry. That sounds like an well, excellent just, time to show a picture of this beauty, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, let's do that. Okay, here it comes, everybody. Ooh. So there's, what, there's, now that color is the that is the original color. Yes, only in in 1980s the only year a 116 came in that color. You almost never see that color. I don't remember what the color code is. I wonder if Belinda, who's watching, I don't knows. know offhand. I can get it, no. but what always amazes me about this color is it's referred to as a blue green or something that makes no sense to me. I think the car is green. Well, okay. I can um, tell you right now, I think a trend we're seeing on this Facebook Live is the moment we show that car, the love is coming. So um, Belinda, we, we, we need your help. We need the alley-oop on this one. What, what is the color code on this baby here? <laughs> I have the... I have a hard time with na remembering names of things, and so color codes is something that I have been kind of putting off diving into learning because it's a lot of names. Um, yes. A lot of names. What I loved about um, when we were trying to figure out what the, the color for that car was, just in doing our research, it just fascinated me that you could easily find it. Uh, there's a little metal tag on the inside of the engine that has the color embossed on it and that's how we found out what it was and i just thought it was just so methodical and easy to learn that so did it was that your second restoration project was that one that was the third um we have another car like this that's actually being restored now we did a little bit of work on it i actually got in an accident and it uh did not get hurt at all and we're fixing it so this is our second 116, and we have another one that wind drives, which you don't have a picture of. So this is our third restoration project. What was it like? I guess, let me pull back a second. I, I'm interested in hearing more of what it was like for you all to like endeavor into these projects together. You know, it's not a, a lot of times people are doing this alone. Um, and if they're lucky, they have a supportive partner. Um, but I, I love this story that the two of you like, you know, kind of, I know Michael had this longer history, um, but you're kind of going through the process of falling in love with a vehicle together, um, which I think is really beautiful. Well, I mean, I um, understand how, you know, this is Michael's passion, these cars. And um, I have other passions myself, but I want to support his passion. And he's so wonderful about asking my opinion. Um, there's a lot that Michael has like a little formula that he does with these cars. Um, and maybe that's something you want to talk about. I don't know. But, you know, do you like this steering wheel? Do you like these mats? What about this leather? What should we do? Um, you know, we, one of the car, the car that we're working on right now that was uh, in an accident, we have been going back and forth and back and forth on the what color it should be. And, and we finally decided that it should be the green that um, your grandfather's car was. But that's what's so great about it is, is um, the the you know, the point the that, the, that Wynn is touching on, though, is that what will be apparent to some people listening, I think, is that we're not purists. I'm not. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't mind changing the color of a car. Um, the car that we're talking about was in an accident. It's astral silver, and I've never liked that color, but it was a good car, so I bought the car. So, you know, we have the, the good fortune of being here in Mexico where there are artisans and craftsmen, people who really know how to do this work so that it's affordable for us. We couldn't do this in the U.S. so that we can we can take a car down to the metal and change the color. So that that's the context for what Wynn is saying. Yeah. And so we have customized these cars to our taste. 
Right, the interior of that green car, I think you have a picture of it, was not a color that came from Mercedes. That's a color we, we picked that we thought just worked well with the, with the color of the car. I mean, that's yeah, a can... rough way. <laughs> so did so you have, have the... on screen now, yep. Did you have the inlay of that door panel changed along with the seats? Yes. Okay. Yes, we did. It actually looks so, really good, really natural. I'd, I've seen changes like that before um, that weren't always uh, as smooth as this. Um, it almost looks like an alternate version of the Euro door cards. Um, yeah, I know I what know. you mean. That's I yeah. hadn't thought about that. Um, this this leather came from Leon in Mexico. Okay. And it was just the color we we found, and as soon as we saw it, it was like, oh, well, that's the color. But this interior shows, um, I'm going to just call it our formula with, um, you know, we want to have all the seats uh, with this kind of cognac tone. Uh, the floors have something called a cocoa mat on the bottom. And in order to tie some of the colors that might not necessarily go together, you can have the cocoa mats um, yeah. woven in different shades to combine the colors. We have a wooden steering wheel. Um, I, does this have a stick? Yeah, we have the wooden knob on the stick shift. Uh, I'm trying to think what else, what am I missing? Well, this is just a good example of yeah. not being a purist. This is not for everybody. Some people don't like a wood steering wheel and would never change it, but I, we don't have a problem doing it. I really think it's just a subjective choice. I mean, it depends on the car too. You know, I don't, you know, it's, you're not going to do that if you come across a car with 20,000 miles in perfect condition. But, you know, right. when you're doing a, like, from the frame up restoration, you have a little more, um, it's easy, it's easier to feel into that flexibility. Right. It's a blank palette. I mean, that's what and we you, love about this. And you sourced the Euro bumpers and headlights for this as well? Yes, I found those bumpers in Mexico City and the lights from the same person. Um, I was pretty surprised. And they're not that easy to find. They're very difficult. You can fabricate the ones for 107s, but um, I'm not, there's supposedly somebody in Vietnam who does the 116s, but they don't have the fasteners and getting yeah. these on was very, very difficult. So we're, do you know if these were OEM from another, they like were. used from another vehicle? That's, That's great. exactly what they were. Yes. So they were, hard to and find. They're not, so the American imports were not fitted. The places where the um, bumper is installed is does not match the Euro spec bumper. So you mean the, it, the holes in the front fenders? Correct. So mouth. it took, yeah. It took a, a body guy and a craftsman to figure out how to get that on there uh, so it, so that it looks correct. And they, I actually, I admit they're not exactly OEM. Um, they're not perfect, but they're very good enough and we love it. That's I really think the lines... <laughs> I'm so sorry, Sheila. Oh, no, no problem. I, I just, I really love the lines with the 116 Euro bumpers, the way it just streams into the center chrome at molding um, along the doors and the fenders. It's just like mm -hmm. continuous. And yep. you really don't get that with the larger US bumpers. No, that's for sure. That's for sure. Some people I've heard refer to the American bumpers as park benches hanging off the front of your car. Yeah, good for hanging out in parking lots. <laughs> right, that's right. You know, it's been, doing this together has been really fun. I wanted to go back, part of um, my answer to this, you asked how we did, do we do this together? One of the key pieces of it is, is that we made friends with mechanics that we could learn from. And probably the smartest thing I heard from one of the mechanics early on 
was that if you're going to get involved with old cars, you have to let them be old. It's okay that they always need something. That's just what it is. And if that's not okay, then don't own them. Um, there isn't a day that goes by where there's like not something to do on, on the cars. There is, there always is. And these cars, like every car, have their own problems. And the other piece of advice I got was, if you're gonna, if you like these cars, then keep collecting these. Whether it's a 107 or a 116 or a Porsche, it doesn't matter. And that was good advice because I've been tempted now and then to venture off and pick something up that looks interesting or fun. And actually, we have and have sold it. But um, this way. You know, I'm not a mechanic. I, I understand what the cars need, but that's where my knowledge stops. So I've been have to rely on my knowledge about what's wrong, what can get fixed, and the advice of just stick with one thing that you really love was, at least for us, really good advice. Well, and having done that, you almost have an intuitive sense about what like if there's this little, you know, let the car be old. If you hear a little something, you're like, oh, I bet it's this. Yeah, we're getting pretty good at that. And you'll tell the mechanic <laughs> and they're like, hmm, and they'll check it out and they'll go, you were right. Yeah, that happens. But that's from owning the same kind of car, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah, think the more you know, the more you know, the more you know, it just keeps going. I mean, for me, that's why I stopped restoring them because I couldn't stop. <laughs> It's like there's well, always so you can always keep perfecting them and um you know knowing so much about the vehicles like you know you're saying how we, we were talking about that experience of getting behind the wheel and you know how it changes your perspective because of the way that they drive and you're talking about your experience of um being in a near uh serious collision and the responsiveness. So when you know how they're supposed to drive and then you're, you drive one that's off from that, it's noticeable. And to most people who aren't used to them, you know, if you're used to Volkswagens like I was, and you get into a classic Mercedes that has a whole bunch of steering and suspension problems, you might not even notice because it's right. su still such an upgrade you know, with its 40 year old, like suspension parts in there, it's still um, riding smoother than a 10 year old Volkswagen. So, <laughs> so yeah. exactly. And, you know, we, we live in Mexico, we're, we're here in Mexico right now, where the roads are not terrific. And our 40 year old Mercedes are far better on Mexican roads than our suburban than our Chevrolet suburban which is a piece of junk. The, um, uh, these cars go over bumps perfectly, absolutely perfectly. We, we've redone the suspension on them, but there's no comparison. You guys had touched on something earlier that I think is an interesting spot to shift the conversation, was the difficulty of sourcing and finding parts with some confidence that parts will work on vehicles that are approaching this age. And, you know, I wonder if Sheila, this is a really good time to talk a little bit about how MBZ parts has formed as a business to kind of solve that, that problem that, that will only exponentially get, you know, more difficult as these cars age more. Yeah. I mean, really, you know, so, my my entrance into mercedes was with diesel from the late 70s early 80s which were a big um big focus for a time uh in this whole niche um but we we and that's so that's where i started the business but we expanded from there really based on need um aside from just you know parts interchanging from one model one chassis to another it's like the demand is is really intense because it can be really hard to find parts. And that's actually, so I started restoring cars um, or, or doing partial restorations at least. And I switched to doing parts um, because my experience of trying to source parts 
for the cars I was working on was so difficult. And, you know, a lot of people who, who fix these cars um, end up having a bunch of parts cars sitting around because it can be so difficult. We left ours on the them. side of the road. We took what we wanted and just <laughs> left them. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it actually, so my one of the first, I, I started this business with five parts cars and one of those five was my personal wagon. And it was very hard to let it go emotionally at first and then when i kept having people like nearly begging me for parts it wow. it kind of yeah. shifted that dynamic you know it's like the bumpers went to someone in australia we cut one of the rear quarter panels out and sh shipped it from oregon to la and i started to see how my one car that i had to make this really difficult decision around it was very rusty by the way um it it was giving life to many other vehicles at, in turn um and that you know that place of trying to fulfill this demand this need um kind of kept going with how i would shape the company from there um so that's what we've been doing we shifted from used diesel Mercedes parts over the years to more and more um, all class of Mercedes parts used, not just used, not just rebuilt, also brand new parts. And ultimately what we're working to do with our current exp expansion is to be a true one-stop shop. You know, we don't, it, it's a lot of work to shop around for parts. And, you know, we there's can certain, tell you, oh my God, is it true. ever. <laughs> I mean, there's yes. certain things like your Euro bumpers for 116 that it, it's still going to be hunt. You're still going to be hunting, um, you know, for the really rare stuff. It, it's always going to be that way, but it shouldn't have to be as hard as it is. And Mercedes Benz, unfortunately, as much as they are dedicated to um, preserving um many of these vehicles, they're not making it easier to buy parts. It's it's getting continuously harder. More of them are being discontinued. And the more parts that are discontinued, the more you have to shop all around. So, you know, we're trying to cut that out and, and make it easy for everybody um, because it really isn't. What's what's been your experience as uh, classic Mercedes owners, Wynn and Michael, in, in this area of sourcing these parts? Well, it depends. Like what Sheila just said, it depends what it is. Very much so. There's some basic stuff. Um, I've also noticed. So, a lot of these older Mercedes, the ignition tumblers will freeze, and then you need to take go in through the steering column, and it's a big mess to be able to drive your car. And when we discovered that problem, we knew of no source to solve that problem. And we had, thank God, a mechanic who in, in sort of hotwired it and made us a separate ignition tumbler and, until I found another 116. I actually flew to Grand Junction, Colorado and got it out of the car, out of this junked up car. And um, now you can get ignition tumblers. People have, are, uh, there's a good secondary market for that. So that's an example in one way. The, the bumpers, very difficult. Window regulators. Window regulators you can buy. They're very expensive from Mercedes. You can buy them from China. I've been through three or four of them that don't work. That, that can be very difficult. But... I guess maybe the more common, the, like if you're going to get tie rods, pulpo. okay. When and Wynn's reference to a, a pulpo is is for the eight cylinder fuel distributor because it looks like an octopus. Um, we have somebody who can rebuild those instead of buying them rebuilt, and um, that's been a huge savings for us. So I think the more you know the car, the easier it is to understand what you're looking for and how to be efficient about it. But um, that's a big curve, and I have spent many, many hours 
um, spinning my wheels and then getting parts that are no good. I, I just got one that I have to return from a very reputable parts dealer. So it, it is kind of hit and miss. You know, the idea of a one-stop shop is for this, a fabulous niche. So how how has MBZ Parts played into these restorations for you? How is How is dealing with a place that has this level of knowledge and understanding um, of the vehicles and, and the experience um, change these projects for you? Well, put it this way, uh, and I don't want to sound like, you know, an unabashed cheerleader, but when I called Sheila's company and told them what I needed, I got it quickly, like in a few days. And the the one-on-one -on -one part is great. That's huge. Plus the knowledge, you know, I, you, I have, to have the confidence where you can call a person instead of going online uh, with some gigantic catalog and not talk to anybody and hope you get something that works is, is great. I want to jump in. My sales manager reminded me that we actually have a set of 116 Euro bumpers right now. Case, okay, well, up. I know where to find you. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So I think what's really interesting to, to bring up on this is that um, right now, MBZ is going through a process where not only is their business expanding and growing, but they're bringing up, up an opportunity um, for great customers like you guys and, and people that are enthusiastic not only about classic Mercedes and businesses like MBZ that, that specialize in servicing these customers, but to fuel their expansion, they're actually running something called a um, investment crowdfunding campaign. And, and I wanna take a moment to, to introduce what that concept is. Um, the, the campaign is over on WeFunder, and this is the, the place where you can go see it right now. And I'm gonna go bring it up for us um, on the screen. And basically, um, what happens is you can, as a um, classic Mercedes owner or just anyone that is enthusiastic about great business opportunities, come over to this website on WeFunder, check out MBZ Parts. And you can actually become an investor, become a partner in the journey of MBZ as they grow um, to fulfill the needs of enthusiasts like Wynn and Michael. Um, this is, just like anything, an investment. You don't have to be an, an accredited investor. You don't have to have any sort of special certification. Anybody for as little as $200 can just come right on over here, check out the page, check out the offering, read up about the company. And if this sounds like the kind of thing that, that you see value in moving forward, check out the financials and consider becoming an investor. Just like any other investment, you know, you never risk anything that you can't afford to lose and all, all investments are are opportunities not guarantees but i think as you're hearing um sheila and her team have really cultivated um a culture and a level of service to their customers that you really can't find anywhere else and um the opportunity to be able to be a partner in that expansion is right here so i encourage everyone to go Check out wefunder.com slash MBZ parts. Uh, more beautiful pictures of, of customers, their cars and their owners. Check out right there. Uh, so lots of beautiful Mercedes love there. Um, but check out the offering and see if it's something that, that's right for you. Um, so let's let's bring it back and land this ship. Um, what What has been the most rewarding part, Sheila, of your journey in um, supporting people like Wynn and Michael in their pursuit of, of breathing new life into these vehicles? Uh, it's a tough question, and you caught me off guard. Good job, Sean. <laughs> I, I um, try. I try. <laughs> I had to think about it for a second. Um, but, I, you know, doing this for, it doesn't, in some ways, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. Um, but I've really seen so much change over the last decade. And there was this 
tipping point where I saw a lot more. It was it was really 123s in particular, which is probably the largest uh, segment um, of the niche. Um, when you know we saw this like dwindling of the DIY daily driver, and um, that that was really interesting to witness. Um, fewer and fewer people who are just trying to get the parts to keep their car on the road. And seeing that drop was one thing, but then what was really exciting was seeing the rise of more and more people um, really embracing the life and just being like, you know what, I, I love these cars and I don't want to see, I don't want to let them go. And, you know, this 123 that I've been driving or 116 or 126, you know, I'm really thinking about that era of the late 70s and early 80s because that's the shift that happened is, um, and 107s too, um, seeing that shift of more and more people who, you know, couldn't get that grin off their face that Michael referred to. Um, and and see it, it was almost like witnessing people falling in love with these cars all over again and and letting it become this like deeper passion um and i that's something i've really only seen you know started seeing about five years ago and what now is happening as a result is also really beautiful um which is uh, I think Michael was saying this to me um, in another conversation of just seeing this rise of younger people. Um, you know, people, I, I'm in my late 30s, people younger than me um, starting to get really excited about these cars. And I think that's in part because they saw, you know, people like Michael and Wynn just like, being unable to remove that grin and like accumulating more and like not turning back because why, you know, why would you like, why would you want to drive anything else other than for convenience's sake or financial reasons? And if you let convenience and money run your life, what, you know, what kind of life is that ultimately? Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a precise answer or more of a broad um, the broad scope of it's, it's been beautiful to witness. And I, I'm personally really excited to see what happens over the next five to 10 years. Um, as you know, these cars continue to shift and ho hopefully we continue to see more and more younger owners. Um, well, that'll keep your business. <laughs> going and going. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that helps. <laughs> Um, so last question, um, uh, for Michael and Wynn, um, what, I think you've touched on it, but what advice could you give that younger enthusiast that's thinking about picking up their first classic Mercedes? What, what would be like the most important piece of wisdom you can instill upon them as they go down this journey of bringing life into one of these vehicles? to be patient yeah. and to understand that y you are in a way rescuing a piece of artwork. It's not just transportation. Um, I, I would like to think that people who uh, own these cars intuitively feel that and I would think that you know if you don't if you don't feel that they're not for you. That's what they are. This, this is rolling art. You don't see this anymore. I can't think of any car on the road made today or in the last 15, 20 years that comes close to this. So that's that for us. That's what that is. That that would be my advice: is that if you want to be the steward, not so much the owner of a piece of artwork, that's what this is. And I think that what um, Chris from uh, the, our beloved, one of our first mechanics said, let the cars be old. Let them be what they are. Yeah. Well, I think that is a perfect place to leave this here. So thank you so much um, 
uh, Wynn and Michael for joining us. Thank and, you. Um, yeah, Sheila for facilitating this world with your company and starting this new series on Facebook here. Doing my best. All right. Thank you. So, Thank you so having much. Us. Thank you for having us. We're, we're going to yeah, do more of these. Thank you, Michael, and so much. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think the goal is um, to do more of these conversations. So if you're if you're someone out there like uh, Wynn and Michael and you're a classic Mercedes owner and you would love to share beautiful pictures of your art and chat about uh, chat about these restorations, um, hit up Sheila and her team over here at mbzparts.com and uh, or hit uh, come on the Facebook and leave a comment, share some pictures, and uh, we'd love to to get on the old Facebook live here and talk to you. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank Thanks you. so much, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.